In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. Got an idea you'd like to see built? Why not send it to the Ben Heck Show? Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. We're changing things up a bit with our full season. Now each episode will focus on a single project or viewer suggestion. This will give us more time per episode to show the detail of the project. We'll still be making our big builds, but now those will have their own dedicated episodes every few months instead of being spread out over several months. Don't worry, we'll keep you posted on what we're working on. Let's take a look at today's viewer challenge. It comes from Erica Kokobi who writes, Hi Ben, I've followed your game console mods for a while. My husband and I are currently deployed in Afghanistan and have been working on several different models of ruggedized game systems. I'd like to enlist your help in designing and building a mini version of our cases, specifically using a Storm IM2600 case. I know you do amazing work and I'd really like your expertise in moving forward. Thanks in advance for your help, Erica Kokobi. So what Erica is suggesting is that instead of making a game system inside of a custom case that we build ourselves, we build a game system inside of an existing Pelican case like this one. Let's call them up via Skype and discuss exactly what they need. All right, well, we've got them on the video phone using Skype from Afghanistan. So say hello to our special guests. Could you introduce yourselves? I'm Erica Kokobi. And I'm Chris Kokobi. Uh, I travel a lot working with the military, and uh, I'm always playing video games with my buddies, and when we're out here, things get slow, so we play video games past the time, so I always thought it'd be nice to have something more portable uh, to carry my game system in. So you have a monitor picked out that you know will fit in this case that you've sent me? It's been taking us a while to build it, and they keep discontinuing monitors on us. Yeah, I hate when that happens. That's, uh... <laughs> See, I was doing some calculations yesterday, and by calculations, I mean I was drawing lines on the screen. And it seemed to me that 20 inch was about the limit for this case, but you're saying once you take apart a 22, it fit. Um, are you guys using an external right. external audio amplifier? No, we were just using the, uh, the speakers that came with the monitor. All right, so what else do you want in this thing? You're talking about a network switch? So the network switch, we thought, uh, we have a, basically we want to be able to, when we're out with a couple guys, and they all have one, I don't have to bring it up plug everybody into. I can just plug them into the case. Element 14 is going to actually spring for this for you, so it'll be a gift from them. And thanks for your service over there. Oh, wow. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, why don't we uh, talk more via email and uh, get me a better detailed list of what you want, and we will get this thing together for you as soon as we can. Awesome. Sounds, Sounds great. great. This is the screen they want to put in the Pelican case. It's a Samsung. It has built-in speakers, which is handy. But I definitely think we're going to have to uh, remove the casing for it to have any chance to fit. Remember, on most modern monitors, there might be one or two screws to start, and the rest of it basically just snaps apart. It's always important to mark things when you take it apart so you can put it back in the same way. So this power for the bulbs will mark the inside ones some green so we hook it up right when we put it back together. Almost any LCD you take apart, at least uh, older one that doesn't have LED is going to be the same way. Driver board, power board. How do LCD monitor prices keep plummeting, you might ask? Well, look at this. Four whole screws, that's the only thing keeping this together. Plus the um, board with the buttons for the front control. It's not even screwed in place, it's sonically welded. So we're going to have to actually snap it out of there. See that? <laughs> Again, cheaper than screws. Something to watch out for. I noticed this rubbery material here. This is actually uh, transferring heat from this heat sink into the RF shielding. So we've got to make sure that this package is cooled sufficiently in the new unit. So this is kind of the moment of truth. We've got to see if all this stuff fits up here. Uh, this one might be dubious, so. Let's see, put that there. We've got our driver board, and of course the LCD. Well, the LCD and everything fits, 
some of these portions on this board might be a bit tall, but I think we can make it work. So the next thing to do would be to draw this into the computer. The most important thing to do with a design is to replicate the case accurately on screen. And the most important thing about the case is the perimeter of the inside of it. Now if you take a base measurement from the edges, here, 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 and here, you get 20 by 14 inches. However, the base gets narrower in the corners here. The case does this, curves in a little bit, curves out, curves in, then curves out again. So if we tried to just do like a straight 20 by 14 piece, it wouldn't fit. The ends would overlap. So we have to very carefully draw a curved case for it to work. Now I've already drawn in the screen, however, I did not put the good case on it. So I'm going to take this and bring it up here. So this represents the screen inside the case. As you can see, we got it right up to the edges, but it should work. We still have about a quarter inch gap here and here. Down here at the bottom, we've got the coaxial sticking out, so you can still use it as a TV tuner if you want. The two speakers, and then the touch controls, which are these things right here. But there'll be a big hole, and then there'll be a piece of acrylic, and then the touch buttons will be behind it, as well as the IR sensor. And then, important not to forget this, this is a big notch at the bottom of the unit, so the cords can make it to the base of the unit. Specifically, you have HDMI and power for the screen. With the top half design, since it's actually kind of simple, we can work on the bottom half of the unit. Now, according to the client, this is what they want in it. We need a big power supply, power strip thing. We need a uh, little switch so they can hook up multiple things to it. And this one would go to the PlayStation. And then this will be down here in the unit, and then it also has its power supply, so we'll put that down on the end. The PlayStation 3, I mean, obviously. And that can go right here. There's quite a bit of depth in here. You could almost fit a PlayStation and an Xbox in here, but don't give anyone any ideas. So yeah, that's the basic components of this. Um, this not terribly complicated, and there should be enough room, so I guess the thing is, get everything mounted in here and then uh, make it look pretty. Let's take a break from this build to thank our sponsors, Element 14. Their online community is great for electronic engineers, hobbyists, and students alike. If you like electronics, you should check it out. You can go in, log on, ask questions, find answers. It's awesome. For more information on my projects and a full list of the parts we use today, visit element14.com forward slash TBHS. One thing that comes up a lot in electronics, and certainly in this build, is thermal management. Ever notice they're called semiconductors and not superconductors? That's because they don't conduct all the electricity efficiently and the waste becomes heat. So there's basically two parts of a thermal management solution. You've got your heat sink, which is typically made out of aluminum or sometimes copper, sometimes steel, every so often. That's going to be on your, uh, on your package that's getting too hot. And then typically your heat sink will have fins. And the reason for that is it creates more surface area for the heat to escape. And that heat is transferred into the air. And then you have a fan, which takes all that hot air and blows it out of the system. There are many online resources to help you out at element14.com. Now it's time to go get the CNC routing done for the project. My CNC machine hasn't arrived yet. The CNC designs go from my laptop to the router computer and then out to the router itself. All of the aluminum parts for this project are cut from .080 thickness stock. We bring the case along so we can test the fit immediately. After confirming it's good, we route the bottom frames that will hold the PlayStation 3 and other components. Some of the parts are then bent using a machine called an auto brake. Finally, we paint them in our state-of-the-art production facility. There's three basic parts to the bottom of the unit. There is a base frame, which was bent on the auto brake, and it bolts into the case in these four holes. And on that goes the mount for the PlayStation 3, and this um, mounts to the earlier plate using shock mounts. Then finally, we have the main plate itself, which has grooves in the back so the doors and filters can slide in and out. As I've mentioned innumerable times on the show, you have to build things you can take apart, which means we have to put this together in a certain order. So we put down this base plate, then we'll install things like the network switch onto that. Then we take apart the PlayStation, bolt it onto this, and then we install this on that. Then we can bolt in the four corners of the case. <sighs> I love taking apart the PS3 Slim, because look, you open it up. It looks like a car inside. It's got this plastic molding here with text on it. It says Sony Computer Entertainment. They expect you to open it. Look, a PlayStation logo. It's like this modularized um, 
power supply. It's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I really like, I think the PS3 is um, it's well built. I mean, you know, there's no doubt about that. Okay, now it should pull out. I think my phone just went off. Anyway, so here's AC power in the power supply. Isn't that cool? Look at that. It looks like an ink cartridge or something. Anyway, the, the power supply outputs 12 volts to the PlayStation, and this comes off the PlayStation to power it, or to trigger it to come on. Then we've got the Blu-ray drive, which, look, again, held in place by mechanical retention. Anyway, over here, these might look familiar from coach section laptop episode. These are the Wi-Fi antennas. Ah, there it is. So now we have to put it back together. Hey, check it out, it's TAP, the tool that didn't make it into episode five because I didn't have it in my toolbox with me. We use this to um, tap some nice holes into this frame, so the size four screws will fit great. Just a few months ago, the Blu-ray player on the PS3 didn't have nearly as many connections. This is really ridiculous looking. So if they changed that, and they changed the circuit board a little, but one thing that they very rarely change is the case. So if you draw the screw holes right once, all the hardware revisions continue to fit perfectly. And the reason for that is because making injection molds is very, very, very expensive. So they'll change everything else first before they actually change the physical mold of the case. So as you can see, all these screw holes that I drew in from the PS3 laptop, I had that file laying around, so I just applied it here. It saves time. The screws are all driven. So now we can put the PlayStation onto it. Line up pretty well. Here we put the Wi Fi modules at the bottom of the frame, and use double sided tape to insulate them this metal from this metal. The next step is to attach the PlayStation 3 frame to the base frame. Now we're using these little rubber um, things I found at the hardware store as shock mounts. I didn't quite make the holes for them big enough, so I've got to use my cheapy drill method. If you don't have big enough bit, just wiggle it around in there. This frame goes over this, then the bolts go through the rubber things, which have threads in them, by the way, and then out here. So the whole thing kind of rides on those rubber things, so this is insulated from vibration through a layer of rubber, basically. Now we're doing this with something called a lock nut. It's like a regular nut, except for this with nylon in there, which firmly holds the bolt in place. And you have to put a lock nut on pretty much as soon as you see the thread, because it's a lot easier to drive the bolt into the lock nut than to twist the lock nut on the bolt. You wouldn't think so, but it's true. And there's the frame all installed, so it can kind of move on its own a little bit. And uh, we've got the mainframe here, which connects to the case and the power supply. And back in the back, you can see the network switch. PlayStation 3 is in there now, and you can kind of see the shock mount. See how it kind of moves independently of the case? So that's kind of the idea, is to help protect it a little bit. Yeah, seems to work pretty good. We need to port out the um, power and eject button. There's a little ribbon cable that this hooks up to the motherboard itself. So all we really, really need is the circuit board. Now this header has far more pins than we need. We only need three, eject, power, and ground. But by having more pins, it allows us to remove some of the pins to make a key so that the header can only be inserted the right way. So we've wired the header to the existing button, so we just in there. There we go. Now we can bring the power and eject buttons out elsewhere at the front of the case. So we've got this plastic here for the buttons. Put that in the slots. And then we put these tack switches over it. So you can turn on the power. With the bottoms done, we need to work on the top half. Now we've got the LCD here and there's going to be these frames. Now these things need to fit back here on the left and right sides of these ridges. The trick is to position them onto the LCD in such a way that they will miss the ridges. And this one might be a little tricky. Clamp the spacers in place and then drill through to them. Yeah. Sure, I won't hit my 
my finger. Next up is the LCD itself. So we lay that down, and then we put our painted screen frame over it. So the screen frame doesn't really hold very much. It's gonna have the speakers and this. Really, it's the LCD that attaches to the back of the case. So we'll attach the screen frame to the LCD, and then the LCD attaches to the case. Make sense? All right, the screen's installed. Uh, now it's time for the moment of truth. Will it close? It's kind of like, will it blend, but with closing, so. Fingers crossed. I wasn't worried for a minute. And now to take it apart, we undo the screws in the back, and it should just reveal it. Ta-da! So now we just need to add heat sink on this integrated circuit, and we're ready to go. With the unit working, it's time to put this plate on. Now it has a few features. It's got some filters I taped in place, power switch, ethernet ports, and the USB. And, of course, a sliding door to get that stuff. I can get this to close. Uh, brute force method! That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll start building a pinball machine. We'd also like to extend a big congratulations to Andrew. He's the winner of the Xbox 360 laptop. Zelp, as he's known, was pretty excited to win, and I quote, Holy crap, are you serious? Yes, we're serious. All my friends will be so jealous. This is awesome. Yes, it is quite awesome, and they probably will be jealous. Congratulations again, Andrew, and we'll see you all next time. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic community and online store built for engineers and hobbyists alike. We'll see you next time.